Trust, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program and approved by all 50 state bars for IOLTA compliance. Law pay. According to a recent ABA study about the attrition of women lawyers, women make up approximately 50% of large law firm associate classes, but only 20% of equity partners. What does it cost when they leave? At least $2 million, according to Rupa Rashid. I'm Stephanie Francis Warren, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, Rupa and I are discussing how the costs add up for replacing lawyers and what big firms can do for better attorney retention rates. Rupa, welcome to the show. Stephanie, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yes. Now, you are the managing director of Culture at Work, which is a custom research group affiliated with Working Mother Media, and your background includes staff diversity positions with Fortune 50 companies, right? Correct, yes. And I've also been a management researcher and writer over the last 15 years around the topics of diversity and inclusion in big corporations and professional services. So when you say that it costs $2 million to replace a large firm lawyer, walk us through that. Where are the costs coming from? Sure. This is actually a calculation we did more generally in a professional services environment where we really looked at how much walked out the door when a very senior level professional, someone who's on the cusp of partnership, walks out the door. And what we looked at were a couple of things. One was the traditional attrition cost associated with highly credentialed professions, such as the law, such as management consulting and investment banking. And that typically meant a two times multiple of someone's annual salary. So that's the starting point. But then there's also costs associated with rehiring, with intangible costs associated with relationships lost and internal morale. All of those factors taken together in a model that we built showed that in a professional services environment, when you lose someone who's between six to nine years of tenure, $2 million is walking out the door. Okay. And can you also explain a bit about, I'm assuming part of that cost would be the executive search consultant to find a replacement for the people who left. Is that correct? That's included. What else is included are things such as the extensive training costs. I mean, the law is a highly skilled and specialized profession. So the amount of in-depth knowledge you lose, particularly for someone who is on the cusp of partnership, who you've invested in, who's been a star. So you've invested both tangible costs such as training, um, et cetera, as well as building up the relationships with potential clients. So all of those factored together. And, you know, when we did this in a, a, you know, when I first did this analysis 15 years ago, the sad fact was that when the firm lost a laptop, an investigation was launched, whereas every day, primarily women walked out of the door uh, because our attrition rate for women at every level was double that for men. Um, Everyone just shrugged and assumed it was based on women not wanting the top job or being uh, unable to cut it in these extreme uh, job environments where the demands are pretty significant. Hours um, in terms of the sacrifices you make, et cetera, these are intense, tough jobs. And uh, it was just assumed that the push factors really were explanatory and didn't really require much investigation. And I know there's been a lot of studies by uh, nonprofit groups, including the ABA, about why women are leaving. I am curious, your laptop uh, statement (laughs) made me think, have you ever heard of a big firm doing an internal investigation about why a large number of their women senior associates or their senior associates who are people of color are leaving? Yeah, absolutely. We are, my own, own organization has partnered with a number of leading white shoe law firms across the world on this topic. And what we find is that men and women often overlap, particularly among the millennial generation, around why they leave. They typically leave. The number one reason is 
no surprise here to you or to anyone in the industry, is work life. People will leave big law to go into take on in-house roles um, for work life reasons. They're happy to make the financial trade off. So that's the number one reason. But then in addition to that reason, and that's one we call kind of a basic necessary reason that's hard to change in the industry. A lot of companies, uh, a lot of firms are moving in that direction, creating part-time partner tracks, creating other kinds of innovations around flexibility and leave, but it's not going to solve the whole problem. The other thing that really goes on in terms of the disproportionate loss of diverse lawyers is A, sponsorship, the absence of advocacy and relationship capital internally. We find typically that uh, minorities find it much harder to build those advocacy networks. And, you know, in essence, the legal profession is an apprenticeship profession. So that piece is a really big one. Um, Who is out to uh, develop you? Who is there to have your back? Who is there to invest in you? All of those things matter. And we find diverse attorneys time and again uh, in every organization we've looked at lagging behind majority attorneys uh, when it comes to access to those types of networks and relationship capital. That's one. The second piece is to really advance in these, you know, extreme career, highly credentialed jobs. Uh, one of the things that needs to happen is uh, environment of trust where more senior uh, professionals are giving you candid growth-oriented guidance and feedback on your career. And we find, again, time and again, in every firm we've looked at, that majority individuals, those who look more like leaders, are more likely to get that type of guidance and feedback than those who are diverse. So those two key factors coupled with the work-life challenges, really end up being the perfect storm for a lot of diverse attorneys. And in my work over the last 15 years in diversity inclusion, diverse talent often are like the canaries in the coal mine. They're the ones who are first impacted by real issues in the workplace, in the culture. And that's what we begin to document. And the solutions are, you know, fairly straightforward. You know, my first degree is in astrophysics, so I can jokingly say the solutions are not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Um, But they are, they do require commitment from the top. They require taking on a very different lens to the challenge of what do we do to create a body of professionals who are fully engaged and fully committed to the profession and to client success where everyone can succeed to their full potential. Very different lens than what many firms uh, today adopt. Do you have a sense of whether that two million uh, figure to replace a senior associate is that the price across the board, or would it be different for replacing someone who's a woman compared to a man, or someone who's a person of color, or maybe a person of color who's female, or a person of color who's male? No, I don't. I think that's pretty dangerous mathematics to go into. Frankly, gotcha. every professional who's reached that level of seniority is playing at the same level playing field. And I'll give you an example. I mean, this was based on a business model that I've built and we use for clients. But uh, now actually just issued a report in 2017 where it actually quantified the cost of recruiting a first year associate as $250,000, a cost to a firm when an associate it leaves to be $400,000. And then for an approximate 400 attorney firm, uh, annual cost of attrition of $25 million. I mean, those are big numbers. Mm -hmm. I think the point of doing these calculations isn't to say it's 1.8 million for one and 2.2 million for other. The point of this is to say that the loss of highly talented attorneys, whether they're diverse or not, and in particular diverse attorneys, because you're losing them at a much higher rate than others. And by diverse, I mean female as well as multicultural professionals. Um, The cost of this is significant and it represents a value destruction that law firm leaders and management really, I don't think, are fully absorbing and seeing. And actually being able to stem some of the leakiness in that pipeline for women and diverse talent can really lead not just to bottom line gains in terms of saved attrition costs, but a couple of other things. 
One, there's numerous studies, including ones I've conducted, that show the link between better business outcomes and greater diversity and inclusion. So in terms of ROI and ROE for organizations, but also in terms of innovation and better solutions. So that's one piece. Secondly, increasing pressure from the marketplace. I think this is going to be the tipping point for law firms. Uh, there's a, you know increasing number of Fortune 100 companies today who are creating guidelines, both carrots and sticks, for their legal vendors around diversity they bring in uh, with the teams that serve them. So, um, you know, for instance, HP, MetLife, Facebook, these are all among the forward-thinking companies that are really putting a spotlight on this issue and really using this as a way to sort through who they want to work with and who they don't. I'm curious, when you share this $2 million figure with large law firms, are they often expressing disbelief or shock or they're like, yeah, we know that? You know, it's a very good question. Um, I think the number is part of a much bigger story that we share because the number is a shock factor. It's a headline factor. Uh, Uh But beyond that, I mean, you know, beyond that, there is much more that's going on in terms of under the surface, the culture that enables the types of uneven losses that we're looking at. I mean, think of some of the numbers that we have around, you know, one of my areas of focus uh, in my research And this is not just because I'm a multicultural woman, but because it is really one of the biggest sources of destruction of economic value for large companies and firms in the U.S. is multicultural women. And, you know, the numbers show that in the law, multicultural women represent about a third of entering associate classes of uh, law firms. But by the time you get to various senior ranks, the numbers are in the single digits. So that kind of Mm -hmm. uneven loss really represents a destruction of economic value. So in effect, you actually have to multiply that $2 million numbers many fold to really get at the loss that these firms are encountering. Right. Right. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's talk about things firms can do to get and keep diverse attorneys. We'll be right back. Part of building a successful practice is finding the right payment partner. It's important to work with a processor that understands the complex rules for legal payments. LawPay is the only payment solution that ensures trust account compliance for both credit card and e-check transactions. Trust the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program and approved by all 50 state bars for IOLTA compliance. LawPay. Hello. Before we get back to the show, we have a quick announcement. Starting in January, the ABA journalist Asked and Answered will be making some changes to more deeply explore lawyers' experiences with unusual and sometimes challenging or even humorous situations practicing law. Our first episode with a new format launches January 27th, and it focuses on what it's like when your client shows up with a camera crew, ready to tell their stories on cable TV or Netflix. Helping us dive in is Jerry Buting, a Wisconsin attorney who was retained to represent Stephen Avery after the Making a Murderer film crew had already started filming. We also have Dustin Sullivan, a North Carolina attorney who got national attention when he represented a cast member from MTV's Teen Mom 2 who wanted to skip a court date so she could make it to the Kesha concert. And to give us a sense of what it's like on the other side of the camera, we have Michael Beck, who's worked as a showrunner and executive producer on various Bravo TV shows, including the Real Housewife series, Southern Charm, Don't Be Tardy, and Married to Medicine. We have three episodes planned, so let us know what you think. If you like what you hear, we'll keep going. You can weigh in on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app, or by letting us know directly on Twitter at ABA Journal or my own handle at SFW70, Roman numeral 2. And we're back. I'm Stephanie Francis Warren, and on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, I'm speaking with Ripa Rashid about the cost of replacing large law firm lawyers. According to her, it's at least $2 million. 
So, Ripa, we were talking about diversity and the costs of uh, replacing lawyers and the diversity question and issue with all of that. I'm curious, say that a firm doesn't have a lot of diversity in their attorney ranks, but wants to. What can you give me like maybe two meaningful goals a firm could set about having better diversity? If you couldn't talk about that briefly for me. Certainly. I I think the best rule to go by is the one that your industry has adopted, which is the Mansfield rule, which is an adaptation of the Rooney Mm -hmm. rule, which is that a third of your classes, a third of your recruiting targets, a third of who you, the teams that go out to clients should comprise diverse attorneys. That means diversity of gender. It means diversity of um, ethnicity or racial identity, as well as LGBT and other dimensions of diversity. So that's the rough rule of thumb uh, that organizations are using as best in class as a measure. And it makes sense because it kind of reflects the diversity in our populations. Um, Women are 50% of law school graduates, as you mentioned at the beginning, and multicultural professionals are about a third. So that goal of having a third, according to the Mansfield rule, should not be so hard to attain regardless of size of firms. And oftentimes, I think, not just law firms, many organizations will say we want to have diversity and this is our goal, and the goal doesn't wind up going anywhere. Do you have advice on how a firm can ensure they're carrying out their goal, or maybe once they're pursuing it, if they determine that what they originally set is not quite working, how can they retool and still have a goal, but maybe have one slightly different than what they started out with? Yeah. I mean, goal, goals are not quotas, which is why it's really important to differentiate between directional goals and quotas. So I think the way Mm. that I've seen organizations really handle this well is really being vigilant and positive about setting goals and accountability. What does that mean? It means that you look at the analysis of your own demographics, you look at your own pipeline, you look at your own client base, and you determine what the art of the possible is and set some kind of a stretch goal. And, uh, you know, the, the carrot is, I think, the preferred uh, means of uh, enforcing behavior in terms of accountability. So create incentives and positive peer pressure. So for instance, you might create some kind of incentive pool, just like clients are doing, creating some kinds of a bonus pool for legal providers who are able to meet the goal. So create positive incentives in terms of setting aside X amount of money to reward those partners or those teams that have really reached the goal, as well as there's a lot that goes around positive narratives around this to keep it from being tokenism. I think that's really important when we're talking about diversity and inclusion in any organization, that this really needs to be grounded beyond the moral thing to do beyond the um, thing to do that, oh, we have a couple of great examples, but it really needs to be translated into the bigger picture of this is really the future of business in America and the world, that if we don't acknowledge any of these factors in our business to grow, to adopt in terms of our value proposition to clients, we're going to be dinosaurs. Being Becoming a dinosaur may not happen in the next like six months, but it's certainly going to happen in the next six years. Have you heard of any big firms that might include in their annual bonus a financial award for um, attorneys who did make a show of having more diverse teams? You know, it's one that law firms are very cagey about disclosing in public. Mm. Uh, Uh It it is certainly part of the recommendation set that we, when we do culture audits, and we are involved every year with at least three law firms where we're doing large-scale culture audits of the type you asked about earlier, where we really are looking at the employee experience of inclusion, some of the different experiences of women and multicultural professionals and other diverse attorneys in 
in, in that. What we always come up with a set of recommendations and creating an incentive structure uh, is really part of the recommendations. We do know of certain law firms that are doing this and have very, you mm-hmm. know, uh, those are the ones that are at the top of the leak, leak tables in terms of representation of female attorneys. Uh, but I think the issue is, can this be extrapolated more broadly to the industry as a whole? The legal profession is one of the least diverse professions in the United States. And it, that, that's a reality, given that women are 50 percent of law school graduates and, you know, um, in the teens when it comes to equity partners. Right. There is a real continued mm-hmm. destruction of economic value in the loss of 50 percent of the pipeline of women between first year associate and partner. So what what can be done that should very much have financial repercussions to it. Um, You know, what is less clear is exactly how those incentives are engineered into organizations. That's where it becomes a bit of a black box. And companies are really, really not too um, open about disclosing that. The other piece that I'm curious about, you know, and and I really kind of encourage law firms to do, and we are working with a couple of law firms who are progressive, is really looking at pay equity issues by level. Uh, You know, as you might know, the tech sector has been at the forefront of this. Salesforce, for instance, under Mark Benioff, their CEO, has for a number of years uh, been very public about the pay gap analyses that they do and actually filling the gap through a special fund that was created. So, uh, you know, our exhortation to law firms that really are serious about equity, that are really serious about being ahead of the game and making strides on this front is to actually do pay gap analyses, and have a communication narrative around it that your leaders can really speak to around the importance of equality, both from a culture perspective and a business perspective. And besides pay gap analysis, for firms that have the largest numbers of diverse equity partners, do you see common workplace characteristics? Yes, I'll I'll tell you a couple of things that come to mind. I often get asked, like, what's the one thing? What's the silver bullet, right? Mm -hmm. And clearly there is never one silver bullet. But there are a couple of things that we see firms that are ahead of the curve in the top quartile, if you will, doing that is quite different. One is really doubling down on relationship capital for their women and minorities. I spoke to this earlier that one of the most common gaps we find in all law firms between women and men, between uh, multicultural professionals and majority professionals, is their access to sponsorship and relationship capital. Uh, Access to mentors seems to be even Stephen, but mentors don't necessarily create career traction. What we do see, one of the law firms, in fact, I've been working with for the last four years, has this year elected its most diverse global class of partners ever. And it's hit over, you know, 100 year history. So they double down on sponsorship, which really involves taking your top partner prospects and matching them with senior level partners who can really help them move the needle on their careers. This means developing client relationships and books of business. This means in terms of internal corporate governance roles and having clout and visibility. This involves really enabling these high potential potential partners figuring out how to navigate the culture of that organization in ways that will really position them for maximum success and to be the next generation of leaders at the firm. So creating sponsorship programs that are high impact and really well thought out and strategically done can be one, one, you know, quote unquote, silver bullet for firms. And that's everything I had to ask you for today. Would you like to share your contact information if our listeners would like to get in touch with you? Absolutely. And please feel free to reach out. Uh, I can be reached on LinkedIn, Ripa Rashid. There's only one of me as far as I can tell. Uh, I'm also available through my website at work, which is www.cultureatwork.com. It's all letters, culture at work. So look forward to uh, hearing from those of you who found today's podcast valuable. And thanks so much for having me again, Steph. 
Well, and thank you for joining us. And I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please find us and rate us in Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. We'll see you next time for another episode of the ABA Journals Asked and Answered.